right, welcome everyone. Um, I hope uh, you can all hear me. Um, I'm not sure if you can see me. I think it depends how you've got your Zoom set up. Um, I think we've got a really good turnout already. Um, I think we've got over 60 people here, which is, which is great. Um, I can't believe that there are 66 people in the world that are not completely Zoomed out after the last year. So uh, well done, you, you're all absolute troopers. <laughs> for volunteering for yet another Zoom session. Uh, but yeah, it's fantastic to have you here. Um, welcome to our Tic Tac show and tells. This is the first of three. Um, and yeah, as, as the welcome side says, you know, introduce yourself in the chat, uh, tell us who you are, why you're interested. Um, and yeah, feel free to uh, use the chat uh, to ask questions as well. So I know some of you will be very familiar with Tic Tac um, and the conferences that we have run in the past, but I know also some of you are completely new. So very warm welcome to you. Um, Tic Tac is, it was an annual conference that we used to run, uh, focusing on bringing together a global community um, of civic technologists, uh, policy, uh, individuals, uh, tech companies, academics, uh, to really learn from each other um, about not just what, what new tools were out there, but really how effective those tools were, what the impacts of those tools were in the real world. Because uh, I think we all know that when you build something, it doesn't necessarily uh, work out quite like you imagined. Um, so I think it's, you know, it's been wonderfully successful over the last kind of six years to, to build this community up. Obviously, uh, we are terribly disappointed that we continue to have to do this online rather than in person. Uh, but we've tried to keep the kind of spirit of, of Tic Tac going over the last year by doing different kinds of sessions online. Uh, so we did a few seminars last year, I think, which were really interesting. Um, but again, you know, a lot of people are a bit a bit bored of Zoom and it's really difficult sometimes sort of sitting here quietly and just listening uh, to someone talk at you for, um, you know, 20 or 30 minutes. So we're doing this time um, a show and tell session, which is supposed to be really short, really snappy. Um, we want to showcase loads and loads of voices, um, loads of people that are doing really interesting things in the space. Um, so we are doing seven minute, essentially lightning talks here, um, where people are just showing what, what kind of work they've been up to, what they're thinking about, um, again, with that kind of uh, nod to bigger impact, the influence of, of these kinds of things on the wider world. So I'm super excited, we've got some amazing speakers today. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping, as you can see on the slide, um, the event is being recorded um please ask any questions in the chat um speakers will respond after the event in order to keep to time you know in uh, in order to contain this within one hour it's really not possible for us to be able to to have the speakers answer questions um in their seven minutes uh in their seven minutes slot so what we're going to do we'll collect all the questions from the chat um we will get the speakers to to address each of those questions and we will email them out um, within the next, I think, 24 hours, I think Gemma said. Um, share using the hashtag Tic Tac, you know, on Twitter or, or whatever your social media game is. Um, that's the hashtag we're using. Um, feel free to, to go into the collaborative notes document and, and add your notes or thoughts in there. Um, and as ever, it's completely up to you. If you want to have your camera on and, you know, give us a cheeky wave, that's fine. If you want to have your camera off um, so that you can, you know, stay in your pajamas or whatever, no problem at all either. Um, that is pretty much it. Um, we have, I would say we have six speakers. Um, and so I will, without further ado, um, stop sharing and pass over to them. Um, so our first speaker is Camila Salazar uh, from the Open Contracting Partnership and the title is How to Monitor Emergency Procurement with Open Data, Lessons from 12 Countries. So I'm really looking forward to this. Um, so yeah, I will shut up and hand over to Camila. 
So hi, everyone. My name is Camille. I'm from the Urban Contracting Partnership. So it's great to be here with you. Uh, I'm going to just share my screen quickly before the timer starts. Uh, so let me know when you want the time to start, Camilla. <laughs> yeah, you can, you can start now. It's fine. Sure. OK, so um, as, I, as, as I said, so I'm going to speak about today on how can you monitor emergency procurement with open data. And I bet you also in the news uh, last year, um, news about how procurement was all over the news and there was a widespread use and abuse of emergency procedures. So at OCP, we asked, how can we improve the efficiency, effectiveness and integrity of public contracting during the emergency? So we decided to support 12 different research teams. We partnered with HIVAS to do this. Uh, so that they could explore these questions and analyze emergency contracts in different countries. So we supported teams from Latin America, from Africa, from Europe, and South Asia as well. And the result of this, it was a research report that if you see this presentation, you can click the link here and there's the full report where we collected all the different findings and recommendations from these teams who analyze more than a million public contracts worldwide. So I want to share with you some of the things that we learned doing this research and some of the things that the teams found. So not surprisingly, when we spoke about emergency procurement and data, not enough data was available. So in the 12 countries uh, that we work in, in seven of those emergency contracts were not being disclosed in open data formats or information was published only partially. So even in countries that had open data initiatives, uh, and where this close in procurement data in open formats, since emergency procedures were a bit different, this information was not being disclosed. So researchers actually struggle a lot to collect all of these data, scraping websites through Freedom of Information Act or just collecting the data manually uh, through the procurement portals. Only two of the countries had attacked to identify accurately contracts related to the COVID emergency. And this is something that countries are still working on, how to actually tag those contracts so that we can track things like how much money is being spent on this, uh, on the, on this procurement. Uh, at OCP, of course, we support the open contracting data standard, which some of you might be familiar with. And we have guidance on how can you actually tag easily contracts using OCDS as well. And we also saw that there were delays in the publication of contracts. So even if there was a mandate to disclose this information, there was a delay in publication, which uh, made monitoring a bit more complicated. So based on this finding, some of the recommendations aim at uh, making sure that procured entities are tagging contracts, making that publication mandatory and improving data quality that this might involve as well, training public officials on how to input this data correctly into the systems. We also found that countries face similar risks. So some of the research were addressing more of uh, integrity issues related to emergency contracts. So we found, uh, researchers found in countries that of course there were uh, higher prices and certain prices for key items during the emergency, a high use of multi-purpose suppliers or companies that had no previous experience in public procurement, and also different types of inefficiencies in the process. So for instance, countries like in the Philippines where uh, there were funds to conduct procurement, but then the implementation was really slow in signing those contracts and actually implementing those findings. So. Um, some of the recommendations related to integrity issues had to do a lot on publishing key information. It's not only disclosing the documents or the contracts, but actually publishing granular data so that this integrity checks can be performed. So this has to do with publishing unit prices and also publishing and collecting information about suppliers so that you can do background checks. Uh, see who are the beneficial ownerships of these companies, their economic purpose, and some other background checks in order to avoid integrity issues um, and, and, and potential corruption. Also, some of the great things that we saw doing this research is that in countries where open data was available, using OCDS or researchers were able to collect this data, there were amazing data-driven solutions to monitor procurement. 
So I added the links there so that you can check all the individual reports and the methodologies. But we found, for instance, in the Philippines, a researcher actually created an index in systems using machine learning to match suppliers with local governments, uh, local procuring entities. So based on the historical data on suppliers, uh, this index system allowed procuring entities, if implemented in practice, to easily identify which were the most suitable suppliers. In Paraguay, where all the information is uh, published using the open contracting data standard, the researchers created an interactive platform to explore all the emergency contracts, explore prices, and also analyze information about the awarded suppliers. Uh, the team from Uruguay also using OCDS data implemented an experiment where they wanted to measure the effect of civic monitoring and public procurement. So they, they run this experiment with procuring entities. And this is quite interesting because this could be something that could be replicated in other countries as well. And finally, in Colombia, uh, the Anti-Corruption Institute developed a methodology to calculate the multipurpose supplier index to identify higher risk suppliers. The good thing about all of these methodologies is that they used open data, they used OCDS, except for the case of the Philippines. So if you want to replicate this in other countries where OCDS data is available, feel free to read the reports and replicate the analysis. And finally, advocacy is key. So teams, uh, it's not only about doing the analysis, but how can you action those recommendations in practice? So teams present and fighting to key stakeholders. Some of this research was in local media in the different countries. They run also capacity building sessions with public officials. And some of the teams are actually doing follow up research on this topic. So we're actually running a second round of action research, but now focused on the recovery stage. So hopefully by the end of this year, we'll have more findings on how to improve procurement with open data in the recovery stage. And since I only have 10 seconds, here are, uh, here's my email, our website. As I said, the report is there and you can also subscribe to our newsletter. And if you have any questions, you can write to us. So thank you. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Camila. Bang on time, down to the second. I'm incredibly impressed. Uh, so yeah, thank you very much for keeping to time. I love the QR code that you showed on the last slide there with the dinosaur in the middle. I enjoy a bit of novelty. Uh, so yeah, that was really, really interesting. I think there's some great questions for you in the chat. So as I said, we'll, uh, we'll package those up and send those off to you so that you can uh, give them some attention uh, following this. So on to number two, um, we now have Aaron Leonard uh, from Integrity Action on Civic Tech for Smartphone Beginners is the future binary. So Aaron, over to you. You on mute if you're trying to speak. Apologies for that. The, the little thing changed side. All right, brilliant. So my name is Aaron Leonard. I'm the technology manager here at Integrity Action. And today I'll just be quickly taking you through um, DevCheck, our application, um, some of the iterations that it's seen over the years and some of the insights and the data that we've gathered from it. Um, as an organization, um, you can actually go to integrityaction.org and you can see maybe some of the real-time data from our application that might stream in in real time. So just go to integrityaction.org and there's a, top, a little button on the top right-hand side called development check. And if you click that, you should be able to see the data coming through. As an organization, we operate mainly in Central and Eastern Africa. And we are actually a component of a partnership model uh, that works along funding partners and implementing partners. And we provide the methodology and technology to allow local communities to monitor projects on the ground. In practice, what this looks like is that a uh, promise is made to a community and, and that promise can be from a local a uh, branch of government, uh, an individual, or anybody ha that has the ability and authority um, to deliver that project for the community. 
Monitors can then use our application to report on the progress of the project itself and any problems that they're seeing in the field. So that would be any derivation basically of what's been promised and, and what they're seeing. From there, um, basically we report that in real time on our website, which is obviously available to the duty bearers, but we also help set up joint working groups or um, basically groups formed of the volunteers themselves, local community members and the duty bearers that help address and fix some of the problems that we're seeing. Through that problems, uh, so fixes to the problems can also be reported and are obviously available on our website as well. And all of this is geared towards completing the project on time and as specified, which obviously delivers a benefit for the community there and also for the, for the implementation um, partners and the duty bearers. So it's a very collaborative process. So we've had quite a few iterations over the years um, of our application and we're currently on our fourth. Our first um, really go at this really wanted to emphasize um, empowering users. So allowing monitors to describe problems that they were seeing in their own words and define what they considered to be an issue with the project itself. So it was really uh, an attempt to, to transfer as much power as we could to individuals for, for who the project was important. And this provided really great insight in terms of a holistic understanding of the monitoring process. What was seen as, as an issue or, or something that needed fix, fixing to the monitors and, and the implementation partners, but what it didn't provide was an easy way to conduct comparative analysis of the progress between visits. Different monitors would visit at different times and choose different things to report on. Most of this was also done through free text which added a, a level of complexity, but obviously in, in terms of the qualitative information um, was very useful. The second version of the application uh, sought to resolve the issues that we'd had in the lack of correlation by making everything mandatory. But I'm sure as you can appreciate, having to fill a big, big list of, of questions out with only, man with only um, text can be a bit tiresome. So we weren't being really cognizant or, or, or really taking the monitor's time into account and, and valuing that as the precious resource that it is. The third version of the application really focused on streamlining the monitor experience itself. Um, and that the best way to do that was through the application. We removed fields and had a big shift towards yes, no questions. Um, and it did provide better data simply because there was more data. Um, the monitoring experience encouraged more of it to be done and provided us with more metrics. But we did find that occasionally we needed to go back towards the monitors and, and ask for clarifications or more details or just to, to understand the metrics that were being reported. So the, the kind of lessons that we learned for those first three versions of the applications were that restricted metrics make for simple analytics. And reading off your slides is, is never a popular move, but it's worth repeating. Um, it's also worth taking into account that free text introduces some interesting complications occasionally. It can be an accessibility barrier. In your attempt to be inclusive, to reach out, to try and, and really allow um, the, the users to explain things in their own words, you can exclude some of them that aren't able to articulate what they're seeing properly. Also worth also taking into account is that multilingual environments or especially you know, in the case of multiple alphabets being used, can introduce some real complexities in terms of your systems, but also um, just how you report those metrics. So our objective was to get, get data visible fast and really work with our partners more to, to have what we call the, an open process and a closed questions. So working with our implementing partners, we tailored um, the question sets that we developed to what they wanted to do with them. So we defined the use cases more clearly and showed where, uh, so what options were available to our partners in terms of sharing that information. So the last version of the application changed everything to yes, no, or multiple select. And what that basically meant is that we could report on everything real time. But to supplement that, we put in um, free text options and the option to include media. So if you don't want to type into our application, you can instead just um, include an image or, or something like that, which is obviously um, something that, that 
increases the accessibility uh, and also provides just better and more content uh, for those looking at what's being reported. All of this obviously makes for very easy reporting and what is actionable is always what's relevant. And that's really the, the key to, to making change happen in, in real time is, is just having that there. If you've got any other questions for us, um, don't hesitate to, to ask questions and uh, we'll try our best to get back to you. Thank you so much, Aaron. That was really great. Really, really fascinating. And I, for one, and I'm sure there are many other people here that will thoroughly agree on things like free text and, and multi-alphabet uh, environments um, or just di the differences in characters. I can remember having a bit of a nightmare trying to work in Myanmar last year with the alphabet there. <laughs> uh, very, very interesting. Uh, so yeah, thank you very much, Aaron. Um, yep, I think there are questions there. As I say, we'll uh, package them up. Um, really great. We're up to 85 people here now. It's, it's just really, really super. I'm so excited that we've got so many people from all over the world here. Uh, but weirdly, I'm mostly excited because I think there's someone here from Cardiff, uh, which is where I am. So hello, <laughs> whoever that was. Uh, right, moving quickly on. Uh, number three um, on our speakers list is David Kane from 360 Giving. Um, and the presentation is Find That Charity, a tool to help find charities and improve charity data. Uh, so, David, um, I can't actually see you on my screen, but I'm hoping you're there. Yes, I am. Brilliant. Off you go. <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, yes, I'll be talking about uh, Find That Charity. So, uh, I am uh, from uh, 360 Giving. So, um, we are a, um, a charity based in the UK and we help publishers, uh, sorry, we help funders, uh, grant makers publish data about uh, who and what they fund. And uh, we then give people the, the kind of uh, the tools and, and the ability to use that data to, uh, to improve uh, the way that charitable giving works. And, and we want grant making in the UK to be more uh, to be better informed, more effective, uh, and kind of based on on evidence and data. Um, so, as I say, we're a we're a charity, and we also um, maintain a uh, as part of that we maintain a, a data standard, um, which helps uh, kind of uh, get the, the format for what that grants data should should be in. Um, funders publish their own files on their own websites. So it's very much about empowering them to publish rather than it being a sort of pipeline that they have to go through. And we kind of help them do that and help them work through licensing and, and stuff like that. And one really important part of the data uh, that's relevant for today um, is organization identifiers. So how do we uniquely and unambiguously identify the organizations that are receiving funding um, that are shown in the data. So that's where Find That Charity comes in. So that's this is a, uh, a website that is supported by uh, 360 Giving. And the problem that it's helping to, um, to, to try and solve is how do we find those identifiers for the organizations? And then how do we make connections between those different organizations. So it's a database and a website and it aims to have a record for every nonprofit uh, sort of entity uh, in the UK. Um, it takes data from about 30 different data sources. So scraping da that data, putting it into a common format. And then we've got about 650,000 uh, different organizations in there. Um, and then there's tools to search those organizations to reconcile with um, uh, other, if you've got a larger list of organization names um, and add additional data into existing spreadsheets of organizations. And we do things like enhance the data with geographic uh, information. So it's aiming to provide a bit of kind of data infrastructure for, for the UK voluntary sector that isn't really there. Uh, with existing sources. So some of the tricky problems that it's trying to fix, um, you, can get un um, you can get ambiguous names. Uh, so Comic Relief is a, is a fairly large UK uh, grant maker. Uh, its official name is the, uh, the sort of wonderfully ambiguous 
uh, charity projects um but it's also it's more much more commonly known as comic relief or sport relief and that's what it might be written down as so being able to get that that kind of canonical record for for that organization is important and the other thing it allows you to do is um, to find the same organization across different lists so in this case we've got a university on from three different sources and you can make those connections between those identifiers so what impact does uh, find that charity have well uh, what we think it has uh, is we think it helps produce better uh, grant making data in the 360 giving standard so publishers can get good identifiers they can enhance the existing data that they've got by bringing in data um, from uh, from regulators and they can also check the information that they've got against the original sources so they can make sure they've got the right um, the right result the impact of that better 360 giving data is that we can then do things like um, we can compare who uh, who's funding the same organizations um, so that was something we did right at the start of the um, of, of covid was trying to help uh, funders understand who else they were funding um, and and who they shared common recipients with and that helped them reduce um, coordinate the, the emergency funding they were doing and reduce the overlap um, uh, we think it also helps reduce the, the time and effort it takes to prepare data when you're when you're doing it. It can be a lot of effort to go through and find identifiers for organisations. Um, and we also know that, that others are using it. So it's being used in government and um, by sector data initiatives to um, to help uh, unambiguously kind of define different organisations. Um, so that's the tool and the, the impact it's having. Um, what, but we're not standing still. There's there's lots still to be done. Um, we've definitely learned that um, we need organisations to keep publishing uh, consistent and high quality data. So in some areas, this is getting better. So the UK, uh, the England Wales Charity Commission is updating their API and making more data available uh, in better better ways. But in other areas, it's getting worse. So um, the UK government recently uh, shut down its official register of um, uh, of uh, different organisations within government, which now makes it a lot more difficult to to identify those. And with thirty different scrapers, um, it's obviously work in terms of maintaining those those sources. Some of them go out of date. Some of them are um, need uh, they change and they need updating so th there's work there um, I think it needs to be much easier to, to find the links between different data sets um, in some cases some of these uh, some organizations are spread across five or six different lists and it's not always easy to see that they are the same organization so regulators talking to each other and including those links within their data um, would would definitely be helpful for us. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, in, in, in general, we want more people to use the data, uh, talk to us about um, how you're using it. And um, yeah, we hope it's a, a useful tool. So I think I've not quite used it up all my time, but uh, that's it from me. Do get in touch uh, if you've got any questions. Thank you so much, David. That's really, really interesting. And I guess it'd be interesting to see how much of those, how many of those suggestions might be embedded in the UK's next um, OGP action plan, for instance. I know you're already trying to work on the current one. I know the UK government is uh, not, <laughs> not terribly interested in being completely open about some of this stuff. So no, really, really great work. Thank you very much. Um, I've just realised halfway through that I was so excited about getting going on this that I actually forgot to introduce myself to those of you who don't actually know me. <laughs> As a community, I think I'm just so used to seeing all of you. Um, yeah, so sorry about that. I'm Rebecca Rumble. I'm head of research uh, for my society and yeah, Tic Tac uh, for me and Gemma. It's kind of our it's kind of our baby. Um, so sorry about that. <laughs> I was just uh, I was just overexcited. Anyway, on, uh, onwards. Um, so next up, we have Ibrahim Salim, um, who is from Code for Pakistan. Um, and that presentation is on civic tech versus illicit pharmacies. So hi, Ibrahim. Thank you for joining us. Um, Hello. And over to you. Thank you. So I'll just uh, share my screen. So 
So yeah, can you guys uh, see my screen? Yeah, perfect. Okay. So hello, thank you all for being here today virtually at the Tech 2021 conference. Uh, the title of my presentation is Fighting the Sale of Counterfeit Medicines Through Civic Tech and Digitization. I'm Ibrahim Salim, and I'm the program manager at the KP Government Innovation Fellowship Program. Illegal pharmacies are a big problem in Pakistan. If we talk about KP, which is the third largest province in Pakistan, there are only 50 drug inspectors who are required to regulate and oversee more than 12,000 registered chemist shops. From 2014 to 18, approximately 66,000 inspections were conducted, where over 1,400 drugs were declared substandard, and around 2,000 pharmacies were sealed. 72 FIRs and 544 cases were registered against culprits, with offenders also receiving jail sentences. In an independent report published in 2019, more than 600 drug licenses issued in Peshawar were found to be fake upon verification. These are just some of the examples of malpractices in the pharma pharmaceutical sector and why regulation was crit critical in this sector. Due to lack of digitization, there were issues and challenges at the health department as well. With no online system being in place, businesses had to apply in person, which took more time in processing and no mechanism was in place to track the status of their applications. In addition to this, the health department also faced issues in tracking duplicate and fake licenses. Therefore, the department needed an online platform where users can easily apply for a license, the management can check for duplicate and fake licenses, and users can easily track the pro progress of their application. In May of 2020, the KP Fellowship team received a request from the Department of Health KP to digitize the pharma license registration process. The fellowship team selected the problem statement under the sixth cycle of the fellowship program, which was executed from June to November of 2020. A team of three fellows was ass assigned to the department to, to develop a digital system for pharma license registration and to address the challenges faced by the department as well as drugstore owners across KP. It's important to share a bit of a background of the fellowship program. The KP Fellowship Program is a six month program supported by Corporate Pakistan, the KP IT Board, and the World Bank. The program was launched in 2014, and so far we have completed six cycles of the program. The program brings together technologists, government agencies, and the public to adopt user-centric, lean, and agile development methodologies to solve civic problems and increase civic engagement. A team of fellows that worked on this project include Mohammad Awaz Khan, who, is a, who was a full-stack developer, Aswan Diyar, uh, who, who was also a full-stack developer, and Abbas Khan, who worked as a UX UI designer. The team of fellows conducted a user research survey from 50 pharmacy owners. From the survey, it was highlighted that the manual process was slow and inefficient, and it took anywhere from three weeks to one month to obtain a license, which also required multiple visits to the department. In addition to this, public perception of the manual system wasn't great due to delays and challenges of the manual system. An online system was desperately needed to expedite the process of registration for pharma licenses. Based on the initial user research, requirements gathering, and consultation, the fellows team decided to develop a fully centralized online platform that can digitize the entire process of obtaining a license. The online system comprised of four main mod modules, which included the pharmacy council module, the application module, the DG drugs module, and the expector module. All these modules contributed to different users of the online system. So how does a user applies for a license on the online system? This user journey map illustrates the entire process in simplified terms. The first step is user registration where, it, where the user selects the license category and sub submits the application. This application is received on the DG Drugs department where the initial processing of the application is done and the re request is forwarded to drug inspectors. The drug inspectors are required to conduct a field visit to the pharmacy and conduct a detailed assessment of the pharmacy and its facilities. Things like having a cold storage, proper cleanliness and hygiene, et cetera. If the evaluation is successful, the drug inspector approves the application. The applicant receives the license upon completing all the standard requirements. In this online system, users can also track the status of the application easily without requiring to visit the department physically. In order to make the system secure, each application is given a unique tracking ID, which can't be duplicated. In addition to this, numeric CAPTCHA codes are added in the login screen to inhibit bots from accessing the system. Data encryption is used to keep the passwords and database entries safe against system attacks. With the online system, a pharmacy inspection app has also been developed, which is used by drug inspectors while conducting their field visits. Through the app, the inspection 
uh, the inspectors perform a checklist of facilities offered by the pharmacy. Moreover, geo coordinates are, taking, uh, are taken by taking a photograph of the pharmacy's location. This ensures that the field visits are actually taking place and also validating the existence of the pharmacy, thereby inhibiting fake pharmacies. The updated pharmacy license is tamper-proof and digital. It contains a QR code, which is digitally generated. The license number is generated using the unique tracking ID, which is randomized to inhibit prediction. The license is signed digitally containing a photo of the applicant. Moreover, the license validity date is also system generated to inhibit tampering. The online system has been developed using open source technologies and has been licensed under the MIT license. The code is available on the Code for Pakistan GitHub and is free to use and distribute under the MIT license. So what has been the impact so far? Since the system went live in December of 2020, the, the biggest impact so far has been the, digit the digitization of over 50,000 records of qualified persons into the system. Some records dated back to the 1970s and this exercise of digitization also helped with the re-verification of these old records. With the new license form, consumers are now empowered to check the, authentic, the, the, the authentic, authenticity of license by scanning the QR code of the license displayed in the pharmacy. The fellowship team has helped train over 20 government officials on the new online system. For applicants, the time to acquire the license has also been reduced from one month to 10 days thanks to the digitization. Since the fellowship team developed the system using open source tools and technologies, the maintenance cost of this system is significantly less for the department and it is sustainable for the department to keep the system running. With this, I conclude my presentation. If you guys have any questions, I would be happy to answer them. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much. That was really, really interesting. Um, and yeah, just fascinating to hear about how these things work in, in different countries. Um, so yeah, again, I know there are questions and uh, we'll forward those to you, Rahim. Thank you very much. Um, and gosh, everyone is so bang on time today as well. You know, me and Gemma had a conversation earlier about how, you know, she was going to have to be very brutal at cutting people off after the seven minutes. Um, and yeah, so we haven't had to do it once yet. Um, yet, we still have two more speakers. <laughs> um, so yeah, moving swiftly on, um, we now have David Zamora from Open Data Barometer and Silvana Fumega um, on keeping track of open data in times of political change. So uh, over to you guys. Uh, thank you. Hopefully we are not the ones uh, screwing the, the timing of everybody and every presentation. We are gonna try to do the best, uh, but we are not promising anything. <laughs> so I'm here with David Zamora. I'm Silvana Fumega. I'm the research uh, and policy director of ILTA. Uh, David is the coordinator of this particular project, the uh, Latin America and the Caribbean Open Data Barometer 2020. And we wanted to share with you some of the lessons uh, regarding the content, but also the process itself that, are, that is currently uh, being used, I mean, some of the lessons that we learned last year to develop the new global data barometer. But, but now we are going to focus about uh, the project that we did uh, last year uh, about uh, the Latin American and the Caribbean uh, open data barometer. I mean, to, to give you some of the background, uh, ILDA in 2020 made a commitment to implement a regional edition of the Open Data Barometer a research that it was initially developed by the Web Foundation with the support of Omedia Network and IDRC back a few years ago. Um, and the research itself aims to assess different open data initiatives in Latin America and the Caribbean in order to have a clearer picture of how the region is doing in the field. Uh, we did that taking in consideration that the last global assessment was done back in 2016. And then there was a special edition uh, only for leading countries in 2018. This regional edition uh, in 2020 that ILA implemented so is of vital importance to understand the current situation of the region. Uh, this is just briefly kind of the, the structure that, that we have. And we have 24 countries in Latin America and the Caribbean. There were two sub-regions with different languages and, process, and processes and a peer review system. Just to give you an idea about the, the number of researchers uh, for each of the country in both uh, uh, 
subregions. Uh, this is briefly the, the timeline. I mean, we started to work in January 2020. There was a gathering process uh, during the next three or four months. Then we have, uh, I'm gonna let David to go further on, on these uh, things. Uh, we have a peer review process. And in December, finally, we launched the website and the report. I'm gonna give you the, the details of those uh, websites uh, in, the, in the chat so you can check everything later and ask questions about the details of it. So briefly, some of the findings in, in terms of content. Uh, the leading countries in the region have stand in the growth or even fallen in the rankings, while only a few countries have made significant leaps in the score of the index of open data, uh, of data openness. Uh, the open data barometer measures three dimensions, readiness, implementation, and impact of the open data in the region. Um, in terms of readiness, most governments has, have explicitly committed to release data and to develop national open data portals, sorry. Uh, but in spite of that, the best scores in the region are in the area of implementation, although countries differ in the speed at which implementation has occurred. Um, with, the, with regard of the impact dimension, the region still does not seem to have achieved the expected results. Um, also, some specific uh, things that we found was that the least open data and the lowest quality data sets in the region are related to land ownership, company registration, and public transport routes and schedules. And these are all areas that have significant economic and social impact. Uh, some of the recommendations, uh, they are very broad and you can go into more detail in the report, is that we think uh, government must invest in a con constant and sustained manner in teams that guide the, the implementation of these open data policies at all levels, that they should think about holistic approaches to different aspects of the production and use of data for the public and private sectors, including regulatory aspects, privacy, use of data, emergency technologies. And also in particular, we make a note about that government should improve the quality of their data, but thinking uh, or taking in a special consideration gender dimensions and all, uh, all other relevant variables to include other people in the society in the data that they provide. So briefly, I'm gonna move to David to let us know about the process uh, itself. Thank you, Silvana. Um, so can you please move to the next slide? Yeah. And the next one. So uh, I will briefly, very briefly tell you about uh, some of the learned lessons we got during the data collection process and the data processing. But basically uh, before that, I just wanted to quickly recap on the main methodology approach of the open data barometer. So here uh, researchers, need to answer questions uh, that are part of an expert survey following specific rules that are required for consistency, objectivity, and quality. After that, those answers are reviewed through a peer review process uh, to make sure that those questions, those answers do meet uh, the requirements of quality. Okay, that being said, Simana, can we please move to the next one? So I want to share with you very quick uh, seven lessons. Okay, the first one, uh, make a solid team selection. So these are some of the things we consider uh, during this very initial stage. The coordination had a strong experience with other indexes. All researchers had good understanding and previous experience with open data. Researchers represented both civil society organizations and academia. The team was highly motivated. We had specific questions while we were recruiting the team uh, about motivation and about time availability. So we got good information on that and we made sure we got good people on that. We had good care of administrative issues. That's uh, learned lesson number two. Administrative process was extremely agile for uh, team members. Contract uh, conditions were very clear. And then uh, number three is uh, we made a big effort in digesting the methodology at the, as the very first activity at the very beginning. We had the contribution from the Web from Nation. We had researchers do their individual understanding first. Then we followed that by a very deep uh, training session, uh, putting a lot of attention on the most complex issues of the methodology. And then when, uh, when researchers answered the very first question, we had a deep review of that question to help them, uh, again, meet uh, conditions in terms of uh, quality and, and, and consistency. 
we had very close relation uh, during the whole process. And uh, the other important uh, recommendation was, uh, learned lesson, sorry, was the, the, the relevance of having a good match. You are mute, uh, David. Oh, sorry. You, you will have just a few, uh, when we share the slides, you will have some time there to see uh, that. And finally, um, well, the, in terms of the process, then there, there is a good need, uh, there's a need of, of, of a deep coordination, uh, a, a deep moderation between in, uh, from the coordination while the pre-review is taking care with that, that relation between researchers and reviewers. Um, and again, you will have some, some time there to see our, to our comments. Uh, and see the the uh, the details there. <laughs> Sorry, we took a few minutes longer. <laughs> We're going to forgive you. That's okay. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I was really impressed how quickly you managed to get through that. Actually, um, really, really fascinating. Thank you both, Silvana and David, uh, for that presentation. Um, yep, fantastic. Okay, um, so uh, we have one presentation left um, in a change to scheduled programming. Um, this was supposed to be Will Perrin, um, however, unfortunately, he had to pull out. Um, but we are delighted that um, Amy Sinclair and Paul Lenz, um, Amy from African Lee and Paul Lenz from the Indigo Trust, were able to step in. Um, they've got a really, really interesting uh, presentation on how African Lee saves its users $100 million a year. Uh, so, Paul and Amy, over to you. Hi there, everyone. Hi. Thanks for all the fantastic presentations so far. I wish we were all going out for a drink after this, but here we all are. So let's get going. So we can all see my pres. We can see my slides. Yes, good to go. Yep. Awesome, great. So I'm Amy Sinclair, and I take care of M and E at the African Legal Information Institute, African Lee, based out of the University of Cape Town. Uh, with me today, I'm also very pleased to have Paul Lentz, um, the executive of Indigo Trust, a UK-based grant-making foundation that is part of the Sainsbury Family Charitable Trusts, provides essential support uh, for African Lee as our major funder. Throughout Africa, access to primary sources of law, such as legislation, court judgments, are often functionally restricted to elite law firms who can afford to pay subscription fees, to commercial republishers of what is otherwise public information. Often, even these collections are out of date and incomplete. So what we do at African Lee is capacitate and support local initiatives, forging partnerships with government and judiciaries to create a digital publication pipeline for primary legal materials, bypassing commercial publishers and making them freely available online for everyone. So in this publication, a presentation, I should say, we'll show you how just one of these initiatives, Uganda Lee, is a critical resource for over 400,000 annual users in Uganda on a shoestring budget that is millions of dollars cheaper than its only commercial competitor. Paul? Thank you. Oh, is my, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, I've also got my data assistant here as well on my lap. Um, so you might think, OK, law, that's incredibly dry and that's going to be very niche. Case law isn't going to be a hugely important thing. But if you just take a quick look at the numbers from five of the Lees, you'll see there are hundreds of thousands of users and those are growing significantly year on year. If you look at the green line at the bottom, you'll see Tanzania Lee went from a standing start to over 120,000 users in the span of a couple of years. And just one little niche thing at the bottom, you'll see the year on year, 2020 versus 2017 for Ugandan Lee, the main one we're talking about, which is gone up 85%. And that's despite the fact, if you look at the chart, you'll see a massive drop in March when COVID-19 hit. Back to you, Amy. So our research tells a story of two major impacts that the Lees are having on the national stage. The first is that access to timely and accurate legal information leads to more efficient and effective access to justice. Now, this is primarily but not exclusively relating to the provision of legal services all along the pipeline. So we're hearing from lawyers in Kampala law firms who are telling us that the time they've saved from running to the library to look up a case 
has meant they've been able to charge cheaper fees, uh, quicker appointments, which means that more clients can afford advice or their day in court. We're hearing from judges at the highest courts, the courts of appeal, telling us that digitization of the law has made writing decisions much quicker and they're making fewer mistakes because they have access to um, court of appeal judgments more quickly. We've got young lawyers who have, are telling us that they came to rely on UB during their law school education. And now that they've graduated into practice, they tell us that they don't know how to do legal research without Uganda. They rely on it. And their learned seniors are buying in as well. We're also seeing information from the Lees being used by activists and journalists on Twitter to hold government actors and human rights violators to account. They're informing citizens of the content of the law and highlighting important court decisions. In Uganda, there is one commercial competitor to the Lee, a service provider whose subscription rates of $300 per person are not considered affordable at all to most of the people that we've interviewed. Indeed, only 5% of the Lee's users have ever used a paid service like this. The switch of just this 5% alone saved users 6 million US dollars last year. Across 13 Lee's, many of which with higher traffic rates and costlier commercial competitors, as we see in uh, places like South Africa and Kenya, we've saved users across the board over $100 million a year. Of course, for the vast majority of our users, if the Lee wasn't free, they wouldn't be able to pay to access it. They wouldn't have access to the information that they say is critical to performing their work. Uganda Lee has directly enabled less well-resourced individuals outside the traditional law firm mold to become lawyers, to contribute to providing access to justice for ordinary citizens and to provide the advice that allow local businesses to thrive. Paul, the funder's perspective. So, as a funder, you're often trying to think about what's the economic impact of the money that you spend? What's the return on the dollar? And you'll often see numbers like, well, we get $2 of economic value for every dollar we spend, or three or five. When the Lees are providing for tens of cents a year uh, services that would cost commercially hundreds of dollars, you're looking at a thousand times multiplier, far and away beyond anything that you would ever see from other forms of intervention. And even if that figure were out by two orders of magnitude, which it isn't, that would still be an incredible return. And it's not just simply the kind of interest areas that you might think are standard. It's not just simply supporting law. Having the foundation of accessible law is fundamentally essential for supporting anti-corruption work, environmental protection, human rights, and a whole host of other things that funders are interested in. And yet hardly anyone funds this stuff. It's running on a tiny budget, a couple of hundred thousand dollars a year. Um, and Amy, back to you to break that down. Great. So... Oops. Where to from here? So, of course, with the critical support of funders like Indigo, we'll continue to sustain the ongoing collection, publication of legal information that has become so critical to the workflows of judges, lawyers, activists, as we have for the last 10 years. But of course, that's not the limit of our ambitions. As you can see here, we've got big plans. Um, most critically, we, we intend to implement digital, digital standards such as XML to make the process um, far more efficient. We're implementing plain language explanations um, to help people working in multilingual contexts and for non-lawyers. We're using semantic tagging to enable deeper research. And of course, we're hoping to launch leads in new and especially non-English speaking contexts. Francophone Africa is very much uh, on our list. So all of this, 13 leads, uh, African League coordinating it all from Cape Town is run, as I said, on a shoestring. As Paul has said, less than a quarter of a million dollars US annually is our budget. Similar programs for a single country have cost millions of dollars and are simply nowhere near as entrenched or credible within the local justice sector as the Lees. So we're on a mission now to call on interested partners all over the world with an interest in using technology to support the rule of law in Africa facilitating cross-border trade, promoting human rights, using legal content in other relevant programming to engage with us, grow African Lee into the future. Paul, would you like to conclude? Sure, and just to, to really add to that, we're a tiny funder in the scheme of things. Our total budget's about $1.5 million a year. And it seems crazy that we are providing the core funding to this essential institution that's supporting millions of users and has the opportunity to support many millions more. So 
the big ask from me at the end is, please, if there are any funders out there listening, if you're interested in human rights, environmental law, justice, anti-corruption, please think about supporting African Lee and the Lees themselves, because the work they do is so vital. Thanks very much. Thank you both very much. And yeah, I would wholeheartedly support that. I think I'm a massive fan of the Lees. I think they do amazing work and, you know, the heroic efforts of the African Lee team compared, you know, considering how small your budget is. Um, it's really, really nice to, to see those figures and, and kind of promote it amongst a, a wider audience. Uh, so thank you very much for that really interesting presentation. Okay. Um, we have made it to the end. It's uh, 3.57 in the UK, which means we uh, we made it with three minutes to spare. I'm terribly impressed with everyone's timekeeping. Thank you very much for, for doing that. Um, thank you to all of the speakers just for, for your wonderful, interesting presentations. Um, and thank you to everyone that's joined us to, to listen in and to interact on the chat and ask questions. Um, as I said, we're gonna, we're, we will take all of those questions from the chat, we will send them out to the speakers and we will hopefully be able to, to email out all of the responses to everyone uh, within 24 hours. Well, that is the plan anyway. Um, it'd be great to know if, if any of you had any thoughts on this format, it would be great if you wanted to share those with us. Um, you know, we, we've obviously been experimenting like everyone else in the world. Um, with different formats. Um, so it'd be great to know if you felt that this kind of format, you know, with, with the very, very short multiple presentations was useful. If there's anything else that you'd prefer, we always want uh, to, to get better at these things. Uh, but yeah, thank you very much for, for coming. Uh, we have another second version um, of this in a few weeks time. Gemma, I'm sure you can tell people exactly what the date is because- On the 20th of April. Yeah. 20th of April, okay. Mm -hmm. 20th April, um, right back here, Gemma uh, will be promoting all of the details and the speakers for that. Um, but yes, thank you very, very much. I've really, really enjoyed this. Um, it's been great to, to see some of you. Um, I can't wait to see you all in person. Um, Gemma, I'll hand over to you if there's anything else. Um, no, I don't think so, but just thank you so much to the speakers and everyone joining us. Yeah, I feel personally very inspired by what I've just heard. So thank you. Brilliant. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.